in case Hannah had anything to add to her introduction. Yeah, I realized I didn't uh, address the prompt, which was um, to what extent has that, have I been involved with Trex? So, um, like I said, I helped develop the Plumas Underburn co-op that was in 2019. And since then, we've had two Trex events in Plumas County in the fall of 2020. And then again in the spring 2021. We're planning one right now for this spring. Um, and I was uh, marginally involved also with the Butte uh, Trex event that just took place. Awesome. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, so today um, I'm just going to briefly cover what Miller and I's role is statewide with the Prescribed Burn Associations to give some context for why I'm presenting to you all. And then just to, so we're on the same page, cover briefly Prescribed Burn Associations and then an overview of Trex events. It's amazing this powerful diverse group of people we have on the phone. It sounds like a lot of people have Trex experience, which is just awesome and amazing and others might not have um, had Trex experience yet. And then I wanna jump into some examples where we're tying PBAs directly in with Trex events in Plumas and Butte counties. And then Hannah's gonna give some perspectives from the Plumas Underburn Cooperative on how the Trex events have um, enhanced and the challenges they've faced. And this burn was a, a fall butte Trex burn with a grandson and landowner. Pretty amazing, part of the butte PBA. So Miller and I work on building statewide capacity. So as I mentioned, we're both PBA coaches. So we travel around to the different PBAs and also do remote coaching where we're giving um, mentoring on prescribed fire planning and permitting and burn plans. We help folks with qualification management and answer questions about NWCG qualifications. Uh, we help with workforce development, and then we do a lot of NWCG courses focusing on those prereqs for the California State Certified Burn Boss Program. And then we do a series of, you know, field trainings and workshops and webinars and help people host TREX events. So, that's kind of the big picture of what Miller and I work towards. Um, we don't do any of this for people, but instead we help train folks how to do it. So they're building that local capacity. And, and just so we're on the same page, um, it sounds like most all of you are involved with the Central Coast Prescribed Burn Association, but it's really this grassroots workforce model where landowners and other residents in a given area are uh, forming a partnership to start burning on private lands. A lot of prescribed burn associations also help out on federal lands, and that's just really interesting to see how different all the PBAs are across the state. But basically, everybody has something to bring to the table, whether they have 40 years of fire experience or no fire experience. Um, and this picture is cool because this is also at the Butte Caltrex event this fall. Um, but the first person in the photo is Ken with the Tehama RCD, so he's a natural resource professional. And then we have a PhD student that's studying the survivor's effects of the campfire. And then we have the grandson of the landowner and a neighbor that we just yelled through the bushes at and, and he came up to help burn. So PBA burns are so cool and the best part is how diverse the participants are. Um, so some of you may have seen this map, but this is the most recent updated PBA map. So blue are formed PBAs, orange is almost there, and yellow is talking about forming. And I keep talking to Lainey about how we should make a graphic that shows the development and uh, color change over time, but I like describing the PBA movement as a spider web. So it starts in one place and people from other geographic areas that are close by start learning, start joining, start um, bringing it back to their area and it just keeps growing across the state. Um, now, not all of these are county-based. Some are multiple county-wide like Central Coast um, PBA and others have multiple PBAs within one county. So I think right now there's 18 established PBAs across California. 
Um, I made this graphic to help um, grab some funding for the PVA movement, but it was my attempt at trying to um, graphically display what an effective PBA has. And so on the left, we have PBA coaching in blue. So working directly with a PBA coach for technical assistance needs. Um, now that being said, most PBAs don't have the powerhouse of um, team members that you all have. So there's some PBAs that have no members with experience in prescribed fire and really want to gain that experience. Um, and then there's other PBAs like Central Coast that has folks that have been to Trexes, have folks that have 40 years of experience, have actual Trex coaches nested within, which is just an amazing thing. So you all are already getting that PBA coaching from Phil and Jared and Sam and others. Um, then there's the adjacent geographical areas. So outside folks are coming in to participate in trainings and burns and bringing their ideas back to other areas. Um, you might all see that as you continue to grow, that your PBA might actually split into multiple PBAs because right now you're covering such a large area. So as you continue to build that local capacity, you might just continue to, to grow and form new PBAs within your region. And then the yellow bubble is talking about Caltrex events. I will define why it says Cal in front of the Trex, but um, Basically, we're starting to host Caltrex events in partnership with PBAs to really build local capacity. And that's focused on PBAs that already have momentum going and they're burning and they just want um, that next step of training. And then comes the peer mentorship. So effective PBAs are then mentoring other PBAs with similar attributes. So that might be location or fuel type partnerships and I'll be talking about examples between Plumis and Butte for that. So the TREX model is basically everybody has something to teach and everybody has something to learn. So again, it's this amazing inclusive environment where everybody has something to bring to the table. So really similar to that PBA model. Um, it's an inclusive learning environment. People feel comfortable asking questions. Um, there's no, you know, wrong question in this environment, and it's really focused on building local capacity. So over the years, these TREX events have really varied where some events are um, coming in from outside. The entire incident management planning team is coming from outside into an area, they're burning, and then they leave. And that's not an example of a TREX that's really building that local capacity because we found in those areas, they don't continue to burn once the TREX leaves. So TREXs are not supposed to be a one-time event. Um, it is best to just continue that TREX model over the course of multiple years, similar to what Klamath TREX has been doing. And I think the most important thing to note is this model is extremely adaptable and can be molded to fit the local group or community needs. So many of you mentioned that you've been to the Klamath Trex, um, also to the Cultural Fire Management Council Trex on Yurok lands. Um, so those are kind of the classic, you know, one to two week fully immersive Trexes. We also have other methods, which I'll talk about, like an on-call TREX, weekend trainings focused, and then those often include workshops and NWCG trainings as well. So again, uh, the model is adaptable, but the whole point is that it's an inclusive learning environment that is focused on building local workforce capacity. So some of you may have seen this graphic. Liz Rank with the Nature Conservancy continues to update it every single year. But Trexes started in 2008 when Jeremy Bailey and others um, found that there were basically a bottleneck in prescribed fire. So not enough acres were being treated, not enough burns were happening to get people diverse experience and um, there just weren't enough burns to have everybody get different training opportunities. So it started where it was really focused on federal agency and TNC employees, and which is the pie chart here in this graphic. And then you can see over time, it became more and more and more diverse with the type of participants that were showing up. 
Um, when you look at the United States, you can also see the dots continue to expand across the United States over time. And this doesn't even have the global TREX events because they've now been hosted in several other countries across the world. Um, so yeah, you would have to stare at this graphic for quite a, a while, but I'll share my PowerPoint for folks who want to look at this in more depth. So just to jump into the examples I have to share with you today about Plumas and Butte County Caltrex events, um, I want to start by explaining why there's the Cal in front of the Trex. So um, a couple of years ago, the Watershed Center and several other partners, including Cal Fire and the Forest Service got together and we were actually able to make a Region 5 Forest Service agreement for Caltrex events. So Forest Service, Cal Fire, NRCS, um, all got on board with the Trex idea and they decided to make this kind of California Trex is what Caltrex stands for um, model that actually the Forest Service funds portions of. So um, that is why Cal is in front of the Trex, which you might not have seen before, but there's a Region 5 participating agreement that allows Forest Service to um, participate in these events and actually fund some of them. So just a little bit of background, there was a tracks in 2019 in, in Butte and Plumas counties that was planned for, but canceled. So that was due to hot and dry October and November conditions. Um, then Miller and I joined the Watershed Center right before COVID hit and um, we tied in with the Plumas team and started planning a fall 2020 event in summer of 2020. And the, the great thing about the Plumas area was that they already had really strong partnerships. They had prior knowledge and experience with Trex because they had tried to plan that event in 2019. And they had a PBA that had a ton of momentum, which was the Plumas Underburn Cooperative that Hannah mentioned earlier. So this to me right now is already looking really similar to the Central Coast Trex, right? The strong partnerships, prior knowledge and experience with Trex and a PBA with momentum. So those three things really set this group up for a successful Trex. And this is actually a picture of a burn in Greenville the spring before um, Greenville burned down. And this landowner who's a member of the Plumas Underburn Cooperative's house that you can see the roof in red in the right side um, actually made it through the Dixie fire. Okay, so we had a lot of challenges in 2020. We had a short, uh, planning time frame. They were actually undergoing evacuations and power outages due to wildfires. I think over 70% of one of the ranger districts, the Feather River Ranger District, burned that year. Um, but the team continued to plan. We also had COVID-19. So if you look back at this graphic for Trex, you can see that the 236 participants, um, five Trexes held really plummeted compared to previous years during that COVID year. So not a lot of people were doing Trexes. And then um, public perception totally could have been another reason why this team could have canceled because they could have assumed that the public due to months of smoke, um, hazardous smoke and COVID that the public wouldn't be on board. But this team persisted and just continued planning the treks. And this is a picture of them actually attending a treks weekend during a blizzard. The team is pretty hardcore. So again, I'm gonna share this PowerPoint because it's just these um, org charts are so important, but I think it's too much information to retain right now. But the idea is that we're building these local type three teams to plan these events. So. Again, original Trexes kind of had a lot of people coming in from the outside to lead these incident management teams, but um, that wasn't building lo the local capacity. So Miller and I um, coached, heavily coached this fall 2020 incident management team. We used the incident command structure because it's a great way to plan a birthday party or a Trex event and everything in between. So um, you can see on the left, these are all the partners that were involved in that fall 2020 planning team. And 
it's just an amazing way to have people use their skills and passions to help you plan an event. So, you know, an example from your group would be that Emily with her GISS background could jump into the situation unit leader role, for example. Um, so this fall Trex had 46 participants and instead of a two week model, we actually decided to host it on five consecutive weekends and learn some lessons from that. But um, the five weekends were because it was focused on PBA development and people are volunteering their time and they have other jobs and life happening. So people couldn't actually attend a two week treks in this area or at least the people we were trying to target for the local capacity building. So the, the treks actually turned into four weekends, three of which were training weekends because we always have a plan B. We were not in burn windows for three weekends straight. The fourth weekend was miserable weather that was canceled. And then we had one weekend of pile burning with Plumas National Forest. So I think overall the training weekends were great. We did um, one of the prereqs for California State Certified Burn Boss, the S219 firing operations. We had people going through mock fire training scenarios and talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, had people you know, giving presentations about who they are to really build that team and had field trips with the Forest Service. But at the end of the day, we didn't get to burn a lot because we were stuck to this time frame of these five consecutive weekends that we had already planned out. So in spring 2021, the Plumas team decided to take what they learned from fall 2020 and do another Trex. So at this point, Miller and I were pretty much out of the picture other than coming in for the actual event. And they, with the knowledge of how to in, use that incident command structure to plan events and all the structures we had in Google Drive and everything that we could talk about later, um, they added to their team. So they learned that they missed some people the first time around. So you can see the partner list got bigger. The org chart changed based on lessons learned. And then um, we had more participants, so 56 participants. And then they decided to do this uh, intensive three-day training weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then went on call for the remainder of spring because they just did not want to miss the burn days that they missed for the fall treks. So during the three day training weekend, we really call it like building the burn team. We hosted a RT 130, which is the annual refresher for NWCG qualifications. Still did field scenarios, talked about cultural sites, fire science, and nature journaling. And then we actually had a burn day on that Sunday. Um, and then for the remainder of the spring, they were on call. They had five burns, 166 acres total. Two of them were Forest Service burns and three were private land burns. And I do want to note here that um, NWCG qualifications are a requirement at the Plumas Caltrex. Um, and part of the reason is because the Plumas National Forest is such a strong partner that they, um, they want those participants to be able to go onto federal lands to burn. Um, one caveat to that is when they're doing private land burns, they still invite the Plumas Underburn Cooperative folks that um, may not be NWCG certified. So it's kind of this hybrid TREX where you have TREX participants, but you still have all the PBA members that might be coming in on a actual burn day for private lands. Okay, so now we're jumping into the Butte Fall 2021 TREX, which were just um, wrapping up at the end of this month, so it's still happening. Um, the amazing thing is that Butte County was heavily participating in Plumas County's TREX events, and the teams decided that um, a spring event makes more sense in Plumas for their burn windows, and a fall event makes more sense in Butte for their burn windows. So now the teams are actually going to trade off hosting TREXs in spring and fall, Plumas Spring, Butte Fall, and then they help each other. So Hannah mentioned that she had a role in this Trex and um, actually played a huge part of this team. So on the left, again, partners, you see we're continuing to grow. The org chart 
looks bigger, but it might just be that we were um, organizing it in a better way. But again, it's just amazing to see, you know, this 30 person incident management team coming together to host basically a five month event. So we had the Butte Prescribed Burn Association and the Plumas Underburn Cooperative. And it was really neat. The Plumas Underburn Cooperative folks that were a part of those Plumas Trexes came in to mentor the Butte PBA team on the incident management team and how to plan an event and just played an integral part of that peer mentorship. So we ended up having 115 people apply without trying very hard. Um, and we did not make NWCG a requirement for this TREX. It was optional and people knew that they would miss out on federal burn opportunities if they did not have their NWCG qualifications. So we had 115 person on-call workforce and this did not include the Butte PBA and Puck on-call list. So really, I think when we were burning on private lands, we were emailing about 300 people. So we ended up having 70 people of those 115 people be qualified as firefighter type twos or above to be able to help on federal burns. Um, and then we also had people in Lake County where we're planning the next Caltrex event come in and shadow the Butte incident management team just to learn um, the planning process of a Trex. So it was a really successful Trex. And like I said, it's still happening throughout this month, but essentially they decided to do two intensive three-day training weekends and then go into an on-call burn team, which is really similar to what the spring um, team did. So Miller and I taught a basic 32 course or that basic firefighter type two NWCG course in person to 20 people prior to the event. And we had a lot of people take the classes online as well. Um, then we had a 90 person training weekend to build the team. One of our training weekends was canceled due to an atmospheric river. Um, we did some first order fire effects training on a day where people showed up to burn and it ended up being an air quality no go day, but we still took advantage of the mobilization. And then we, we did some other really cool things at this trek. So instead of just doing that one three day intensive training and then an on call team, we decided that every month we were going to host some sort of training because that was something that that spring treks um, identified that they were missing. So they went on call, but they didn't really get together again. And um, some of the participants, you know, each burn would have like 20 people, but you still had a 60 person trek. So they were just kind of missing that um, training opportunity throughout the duration of the on-call period. So we had somebody from air quality give a webinar on smoke management plans. We also did a burn planning workshop for landowners that had about 21 people attend. We did a fire effects monitor training in January. And then this last weekend, we just hosted L280 followership to leadership, which is another prerequisite for the California state certified burn boss. And then at this Trex, we ended up doing 12 broadcast burns um, and had 147 acres accomplished on private lands which is just amazing. These are all again, PBA burns. And then we did six pile burns for 229 acres on forest service land. And all of that ended up being 305 personnel days and about 2000 hours of time that people put into just the burning, not the training part of the Trex event. So again, I think you can see that we're like, building off of all these Trex's learning lessons and continuing to adapt to make better and better, better and better um, training opportunities. And, and you can see over time that we're also building local capacity, which is also making our Trex events even better and uh, accomplishing more during the, the Trex events. But now I'm gonna pass it on to Hannah so she can talk about um, just like the Trex in perspective of the PBA, which is Plumas Underburn Cooperative. Thanks. Yeah, I thought I'd just cover a little bit about how our PBA looks. Um, it's it's Puck. That's short for Plumas Underburn Co-op, and the majority of the membership of the PBA specifically is interested 
in Black Acres and community building. And so the PBA is designed to reduce barriers. So that's primarily access to equipment and volunteers and help with permitting. And then we have an environment of skills sharing, but it's not specifically training focused. Um, a lot of our PBA folks are retired. They have little interest in a second career and they wanna show up more on the day of as a resource. Um, so our PBA, it addresses the minimum requirements for safety and liability. Um, but in this model, leadership is a barrier uh, to getting more burning done and to, to mobilizing these folks. So Trex has helped us develop leaders. Um, these are potentially career folks who don't have access to agency training. Um, it is a path for us to address um, the CARX requirements, the California um, burn boss certification requirements. And so we've been trying to integrate that into our Trex events as well. So the idea being that with more of these certified burn bosses in the future, that will lead to more burning um, with the PBA. So our Trex incident management team, it includes a lot of puck representation, uh, but it has a lot broader partnership. Um, it brought in a lot of what Aaron was saying of um, neighboring county involvement, and that's really helped um, establish uh, so greater capacity in the area. And what it's done, the Trex has done for us too, is our incident management team, um, it really brought a lot of cohesiveness to the partners. And originally when I wrote this bullet, I, I wrote strength of partnerships, but it's far more than the strength of our partnerships. It's a, like a, a real integration of understanding like what do our partners actually do? What resources do they have? What equipment do they have? How do they operate? What are their goals? and missions and um and i see us leveraging that a lot more than we ever did uh before we went through trex planning together um so the point here being that the puck and trex are not one in the same for us but there's this feedback system um within it that's that's really been benefiting both um entities and Aaron, i don't think i have the ability to change the slide but I do have one other slide. Um, so Aaron did talk about modifications that we've made with our Plumas Caltrex events to I think the standard model that everyone is familiar with. And uh, I think those have really served us well. Um, the locally based non-agency, not excluding agency, but the fact that we have a really robust um, non-agency participation has been a key benefit for the PBA. Um, as Aaron said, that's really where the local capacity building has come in. Um, and so with COVID and with these folks who, who are not suppression focused, who are not with an agency and, and often can't commit a week or two, um, we did look at alternative models for inclusivity. So it was said that that first um, Trex event that we did was over multiple weekends. And I actually think that that was really great for us to be committed for that length of time together the first time around, because it, it gave us, um, it all put us on the same page in a lot of ways that we wouldn't have been able to do uh, potentially with the model that we have now of a single weekend and then on call. But we were really then able to use that to leverage, you know, quickly doing a, a team building cohesive weekend with Trex and then going straight into the on-call model. Um, so, it, and for us too, it's far more sustainable to have it look like that because we're mobilizing for burning anyway, um, as opposed to trying to create uh, a two week event every year. Um, I, I don't think it would be sustainable for most of our organizations that participate. Um, and 
it's obvious and, and Aaron mentioned it, but it really allows us to take advantage of the burn windows that we have here, which are incredibly variable. Um, but one thing that wasn't mentioned that is proving to be a benefit is that when we're um, on call throughout our burn window and it's part of Trex, then we have a position task book benefit, which um, because the Trex event is, is an incident, we um, can actually get evaluations <laughs> on these burns, um, which is really difficult to fully offer to people in, in a one weekend or multiple weekends, but across all these burns with the groups changing, um, there's a lot of opportunities for that. Head uh, left, then turn left. Oh, good, we're, we're going in the right direction, I think. Um, and, oh, the, the final thing that I was gonna say, Erin mentioned that the Butte event has now been offering also trainings um, ongoing in addition to the on-call burning. And that allows us to know that there's content that we want to cover as a, a non-fire training, um, but that it's not going to conflict with our opportunities for burning. It gives us that flexibility um, because if we're burning every day of a two week treks, then we would miss out on that other content. But, and then if we're not burning with treks, obviously we're missing out on the live fire component. Um, so that is what I had to share about uh, Puck and treks in Plumes County. Thanks so much, Hannah. Yeah, and just, just to wrap it up, I always share this slide, which is my favorite slide, Fires for Everyone, which is what our goal is. Um, we're trying to train these non-traditional fire practitioners to be able to bring fire back to the landscape. Um, but as Hannah mentioned, you know, we usually have people raise their hands if they could have joined a two-week treks event when we're standing there with 90 people at our treks event and nobody raises their hand. Um, so I think that that just really depends on your area and the, the target audience. But for Butte and Plumas, it's very much been that they cannot attend that two-week commitment of a Trex. Um, we didn't mention it, but with all those partners involved, our Trex events have been relatively inexpensive because all those partners are bringing something to the table. And then I, I also just want to mention that the local capacity piece really um, showed through for Plumas this year because one of their primary leaders for the Plumas Underburn Cooperative ended up moving to the Midwest. And, you know, instead of the whole PBA just coming to a crash, you know, there's a deep loss within this, the community because he was such an important part of their community. But the prescribed fire movement is still actively moving on. And he was an integral part of our incident management team, but folks have been being trained in all those different roles so they can fill his shoes um, even though he's moved. So it's something that we don't see in other areas where they're not focused on that local capacity amongst many, is that if they have a leader leave, the, the PBA really hurts. So. Anyway, I think that's all we had, Jared, for, for the background and some examples. Great. Um, thank you, Aaron and Hannah. Um, a really good presentation. Um, and some really great slides. And I agree, I really like the, the last slide here and um, how much it shows that uh, uh, good fire can actually be for everyone and not just for um, fire agencies and such. Um, so um, we have a little bit of time if folks have questions that they want to ask um, really anyone in the group here or specifically Aaron and, and Hannah. Um, I imagine there's probably um, some, some basic um, uh, themes running in people's minds. And um, so if you have, have a question or a thought, um, feel free to throw it out there. Hey, Jared, I've got a question. Yeah, go for it. Matthew. So, um, I love the, this notion that the Trex is this opportunity for multidimensional thing and sharing, um, both getting fire on the ground and also doing coursework uh, that we need for things like learning to be leaders or transitioning from an FT2 to a one or whatever. What other opportunities are there for coursework for people who aren't at agencies? 
So I want to get S-131 and it's difficult for me to do that um, unless I'm associated with an agency. Yes. Can I, can I ask a um, Matthew, just to speak to that. So nobody, for the most part, the, the people that we're training with the NWCG courses are not agency. So we're, we're training the PBA members that have chosen to enter NWCG for whatever reason, just the extra training because they want to go after that CARX certification. And um, the Watershed Center, specifically Miller, is qualified as lead instructor to teach these courses and we hand out the certificates. Does that answer your question? It does. I was wondering if there are opportunities outside of the tracks um, and how I could connect with that or how any oh, sorry, of us yeah. could connect with that. Yeah. I see. Great question. And, and just to loop it back into the Central Coast perspective, you know, we have Phil Guy, which is just a huge asset that you all have in the area that is also a qualified instructor. So, Matthew, we're, we're hosting these all over. Um, you're welcome to join a mailing list to know about these trainings. And then I know Jared has a lot to talk to the group about, but has some plans for training as well. Um, so anyway, there's there's lots of opportunities. Excellent, thank you so much. I'll put my email in the chat and folks want to email us. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in and add um, to Aaron's perspective, Matthew, um, that, uh, the prerequisites for the, the CAREX, uh, the California prescribed, um, certified prescribed burn boss, um, um, those are probably courses that the PBA is gonna be focusing on because it's a new pathway, obviously, that's of a lot of interest to non-agency people. Um, they're also good classes, you know, the, the S290, the S or the either California or S219, which is firing. Um, S290 is intermediate wildfire um, weather. Um, um, the S131 or L <coughs> L280 um, kind of leadership type classes. So those are things that we'll probably be trying to, to promote here in the, the future. Great, thanks, Jared. Steve Davis has a comment. Yeah, go for it, Steve. Um, two things I've been on, a. I really like to suggest that I like the approach of having not just a two week treks, but over time, you know, throughout the whole year, the, uh, and I've been on incident management team since 1984 to 2012. So I can help with that. Um, but, uh, I would really suggest in our area, central coast that we take a two prong approach one is burning off grasslands and stuff in the spring and some of the uh, on for understory in the springtime and then uh, the brush at this time of year. Um, as the Colorado fire demonstrated here a couple of weeks ago, it's easy to burn off the brush in what used to be called the low fire season, which is after the first rain of two inches and, and the plants have not greened up yet. So, we can train people, I can train people of how to burn at that period of time in the brush and, and get a lot of brush duck taken care of. And uh, I'm a member of the Inter International Association of Fire Chiefs, so I can issue National Wildfire Coordinating Group certs. But I, uh, I concur with that's only necessary if you're going to work on federal lands. And maybe the state park will require it too, I don't know. But um, but anyway, I, I, I concur with, um, with, with the approach from the slideshow and we'll be willing to help out. But I want to push that two season type burning, kind of burning the brush off in the, after the first rate of two inches, which would be like December through about February, through February until the plants start to green up and then burn off some of the grasslands uh, late spring. And uh, I'm working with some people to kind of get the momentum to go to burn off some of the grasslands in the wildland urban interface in the defense zone, which is a hundred feet from houses in our area. Cool. Thank you, Steve. Um, I think actually uh, what you're bringing up is really good points that we're hopefully going to get into into kind of a discussion section about okay. seasonality and stuff. So um, I think we'll definitely circle back to what you're saying. Okay. Um, we have Davey raising her hand and then Brian. 
raising his hand. So Davey, why don't you go for it? Well, um, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Aaron, uh, that was a great presentation. I guess one question, I guess I have a couple, uh, one question, one comment. Um, the question is th this team that has, you know, is here with us today is an incredible team with people with such a diverse um, level of experience. One group that I see missing from our team today is ranchers. And I'm wondering if Aaron, with your experience, you know, working on these treks across the state, is that something typical where you're not really seeing ranchers participating in the planning of the treks, but maybe more in the, um, you know, joining and participating in the treks itself? Or what has your experience been with that? I just want to make sure we're kind of doing everything we can to include that audience as well. And then yeah, I guess my, great, oh, go ahead. Great question. Just to quickly answer that one. Um, so in other parts of the state, it might not be ranchers. We could just lump them under landowners, but um, it, it just depends and you'll know the personalities, right? So they might really only wanna be included for the burning on their land and others. Um, but we do have some landowners actively engaged. We usually house them under the operations role on the incident management team. Um, but people have all sorts of skill sets, you know, maybe you have a rancher who's really good at logistics and they're really into it. So I would just say it totally depends, but definitely not a requirement that they're participating. You only want people that want to be planning to be planning. Um, and then to just to Steven's point, that's awesome that you have experience with the incident management team. And we do call people, you know, plan section chief, operations section chief, but for the most part, unless they have past federal experience, these folks are not qualified as type three anythings. It's just that we're training them what those roles are and they're, and they're filling them successfully. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I concur with that idea. Awesome, and then what was your second question? Oh yeah, it was just more of a comment. Um, I really, you know, you explained, or I can't remember who it was, explained that, you know, in planning these structures and doing all this work, um, in different areas, you've really been able to create uh, leadership. And, you know, if somebody, you know, moves away, you can still fill that role and the PBA continues. And um, I think that's really important, you know, anywhere. And so I really hope that, you know, doing this treks and doing treks in the future that we're able to, to do that here on the Central Coast, just have a really wide variety of people who are able to take on those leadership roles and that org chart, you know, that you showed over time. So that's, I guess, one of my hopes with this. Cool. Thanks, Davey. Um, Brian. Um, well, I did have the question about seasonality. It sounds like that's still, that's going to be in the discussion. Um, cause obviously seasonality kind of really depends how you plan a Trex cause, uh, our different seasons provide different, um, predictability. Um, so I guess we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, the question I had uh, for anyone who's been involved in training, uh, doing treks is, is, you know, every, every treks, every community and season and all that stuff has different issues. And, I, and, and, you know, we can plan around that with the flexibility of the treks model, which is awesome. I do have a question if, if anyone's has any insight into like, what is, is there like a treks model of some sort that really benefits like the first treks in a community, as opposed to, uh, after a community's had a few tracks for the reason I'm asking is um, the, on, the total on call, call thing seems like it would work better with a community that's already got the fire bug and the skills that can kind of hop on really quick. Whereas um, a, uh, uh, a design where you say you do every weekend for a certain part of the season. And then if there's no fire, we still do a bunch of training is probably better for like a community that's just starting because that training's super key. Um, anyways, and yeah, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, Brian, I think that's, uh, Hannah, feel free to jump in, but I think that's what Hannah was saying was that even though we learn lessons from that consecutive five weekend treks and they're not going back to that model, it seemed like Hannah was saying that that model was super effective for the first time in Plumas. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even though the Trex group changes um, each time, at least, you know, there's a core membership that's participated in that initial one where we really set a lot of groundwork. Um, and I do think that was valuable. 
Yeah, and, and another thing to add about the on-call and Matt West, who's also a leader of the Plumas Underburn Cooperative said it best, I think, is it's similar to a volunteer fire department. You know, you have 100 people signed up and you put the call out and four people show up. So we were really emailing 300 people and we'd get 16 people on a burn. We Every time we have these contingencies for like how to deal with it, if we get 80 people showing up on a three acre burn, but we never have had that problem. We get just the right amount of people. It's amazing. Cool. Um, any other questions that folks have? Um, and it's fine if you don't have them right now because we'll we'll just kind of jump into a discussion with a couple themes, and um, I'm sure uh, questions will come up then too. Okay. Um, since no one has one right now, feel free to ask later. Um, so um, some of the discussion points that we're kind of interested in, in uh, working on here is um, just what people's thoughts are on um, the duration of a trek. So like, is it this flexible model um, that's been talked about is it some version of the quote unquote classic <laughs> um, two week treks um, where you have, you know, defined um, period of time where people sign up for that. Um, also there's variables of that too, where they could sign up for a portion of that, maybe like four days or seven days or whatnot, rather than having to do the whole two weeks um, to try to, again, build in flexibility. Um, um, or kind of the, the weekend treks where it's known, you know, every weekend starting in November till early, I'm just giving examples, November starting in, you know, going till mid-December, um, all those weekends would have some kind of treks event, like say in the fall. Um, 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 and then obviously with the notion that some of these things, if you're keeping it just to locals, um, make it easier versus if you're trying to make it more broad. Um, another really important one is seasonality. Um, if we're talking about a, a late spring treks like May or early June um, and the details of that um, or a fall treks or even a winter treks. Um, and I guess I'll just take a moment here to talk about some um, an important piece of all this. So the, the Central Coast and Davie you're, you're involved with a lot of this. So if you have um, thoughts on it, the Central Coast PBA has specific TREX funding and then indirect uh, TREX funding um, via uh, two CAL FIRE grants. Um, the direct TREX funding is about $5,000 to um, pay for um, um, personnel to help teach, teach workshops, personnel to um, um, you know, somebody like Phil Dye who has specific qualifications um, or, you know, even somebody like Brian, you know, if, if even Brian, <laughs> um, a fire ecologist who can come in and maybe give a really good presentation on, you know, local fire ecology or something like that. Um, so we, we do have some funding there for that. Um, we have funding for myself, my time. Um, we have funding for uh, Alex Michelle's time, um, on a part-time basis. And then we have um, indirect funding for specific burns. Um, and I don't wanna bore you guys with all the numbers and such, but um, we have quite a few burns lined up that um, could be part of the treks. And so hence we have um, funding to help pay for, you know, volunteer fire department stipends, um, you know, kicking them down some money. We have money for, um, burn bossing fees, you know, so the hiring of somebody like Phil Dye or another burn boss, um, uh, burn plan writing, things of that nature. So um, th those are some factors as well. Um, and then I think another big question that arises is um, what type of training um, people are interested in um, in seeing happen. And I'll also just say that this planning team is really just a first stab. So if you feel like there's um, people or entities kind of to Davy's point, like um, we have some landowners representative, but obviously the majority of the folks on the call are not 
um, landowners will, will probably be burning. So, you know, who should we be getting involved with the planning team? Is it landowners? Is it say federal cooperators? We actually don't have anyone here from say the national forests or pinnacles. Um, so these are some of the things. Um, um, so let's, uh, I'll just kind of curate this here for a little bit. So let's um, discuss duration and just kind of hear people's thoughts on if there's a um, certain style of treks duration that they're most interested in and the pros and cons. So uh, if, yeah, your hand raised, yeah, go for it. Hey, so um, the only treks that I went to was the Klamath and it, you know, I've heard in the past it used to be two weeks, but the one I went to was one week because of COVID. And I think it was really important to be there for a continuous week because it represented um, the incident command system. It felt like I was back at fire camp where you had the briefings, everyone was provided food, everyone worked all day outside. And it added a lot of diversity and stamina and grit to the whole fire experience. It added a lot of opportunity for people to be exposed to everything that's involved in an incident. And, um, I think that that week long session would be a really nice window if we can have it maybe once a year or something like that. But otherwise I think the weekends would be great too, to just have periodically in, involved with the NWCG classes and other, um, other kinds of training. Cool. Anyone else have thoughts on kind of uh, um, either their experience or just what they're hearing and um, what what really makes sense uh, to them? Or questions? Yeah, uh, this is Alex. Just um, kind of to go off of what Emily said, I was also at that Trex and really agree that having a one week period where we were all working together, getting to know each other, really helped and like having the opportunity for participants also to learn from something they learned earlier in the week and then be able to reapply it or develop on that skill later on in the week was super helpful um and i just don't know if that would be able to happen or at least to that level with like a two-day kind of weekend deal um and also just mentioning i think it's worth mentioning that the pba does like a lot of weekend trainings so we have groups of participants come out and train and like learn and meet each other for that two day time period. And that kind of, I mean, to my knowledge right now happens throughout the year, um, excluding probably wildfire season. So I was just curious, like what would the difference, main differences be if we did decide to go with like a two, two day, two week season long type of thing? Or not two weeks, sorry, weekend season long. Um, is there anyone, maybe Aaron or anyone else who wants to try to take a stab at kind of the, um, Aaron, do you mind if I go ahead? Um, I think those are really great questions. And I do think one of the biggest things we've lost in the weekend model is that, um, the structured team workness. Um, I think Hannah can say that that's still built over the duration. But um, one of the things I wanted to come back to is, is really one of the biggest things that the Trex model led us down the road of success was um, the building of your incident management team. And so, you know, we were using PBAs as just a, a part of that. They're, you know, they bring a large workforce, a sustainable workforce, um, reliable, some equipment, but you also have partners like universities who are bringing grounds um, you can train on or um, facilities you can use or some students. You also have partners, agency partners who bring some of the um, more expensive equipment, hose pumps, um, heavy equipment, engines, UTVs. And so, and then, and then what, what we're a success is, is we're having during this on call season is, um, we're having a weekly Monday uh, one-hour call. We have an IMET call in, give us the weather for a week, 
And all of the partners sit on a call and plan out their burns for a week. And, and so it forces us all into saying yes. And it forces us all into collaborating with each other. And it, we, and it, and it just naturally happened. And so, you know, the PBA is one part of that tool. Go ahead. Thank you. Can I, can I give a answer one thing direct to that? Yeah, please. Um, I agree with the with the the week long team building thing as well. Um, but to offer something about what's different about the weekends, if we do a, do a Trex uh, weekend model with Trex as opposed to just doing normal PBA stuff every weekend, is that I, having done it last year, the the weekend model up in Sonoma, and then this year not doing that. Um, there's something about people for one thing is that as, as people putting on the tracks, you're committing to participants that every weekend, every said weekend, there's going to be something, even if there's not fire. Um, and that's meaningful. Mm. Um, and I do think there is something just about people saying I'm doing treks this fall that does have some weird organizing power. Uh, and like Miller said, it just, it just, it's just like a, it's just a thing to organize around both for the incident management team and for the participants. Um, and th that's some of the value I've seen over the years. If I could, this is Hannah, while we're still on this topic, I think it depends a little bit too on who you're targeting, not as far as um, partnerships, but as individuals. And so speaking as myself, um, I came into this later in my career after I already have children. There are a lot of people in our organizations um, that also have kids. And so I think it depends on, on who you're bringing up and who you're including as a matter of, um, of diversity, honestly. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you all for those answers. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's, it sounds like to me, it really depends on what our main, like our priorities are. So is it like training people and building capacity, which can be done, you know, obviously while putting fire on the ground, but also in like weekend trainings, other things like that and having people commit or more like burning acres. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's interesting to hear like the different methods. So thank you. Great. Um, so we have three people raising their hands. I don't know if any of these three people have a comment on this particular subject or a different question or a different thought. Um, so if you, um, I don't know, and I also don't know the order. So <laughs> feel free to go whoever feels like it, and however it makes sense. Hey there, this is uh, Chanel. I just wanted to um, add into what you guys are saying about the scheduling. Um, so for me, I'm a pretty busy person and um, I'm also a mother of two, including a 10 month old baby that I'm breastfeeding. So for this last Trex, I um, asked if I would be allowed to bring my child and they were very accommodating. Um, I had to bring my uh, fiance to watch her. Um, as she obviously like wasn't going to be allowed to like go on my back and burn with me during like a high intensity fire. Um, but I felt like they were trying to be inclusive for all. Um, I, I believe that the week long treks created like consistency and cohesion among the groups um, because we were all working like long hours. We were all giving up and dedicating, you know, an entire week to this. Um, and then most of us working, you know, in the night after, after the treks, I know I was doing schoolwork, um, at least what I could with the internet. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I really believe that like a week just helps form bonds, um, that, that might be hard to get if you're doing weekends, obviously weekends can be a little bit easier for people, um, with kids as far as planning goes. I just try to like take each week, um, you know, and put my horse blinders on it and really focus on one thing at a time. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to add to that and I'm um, just really grateful for them allowing me to join because if they didn't allow me to bring my kid I wouldn't be able to go. Great point thanks Chanel. Um, uh, SLC you guys have your video on so you mean business go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully you can hear us better on this uh, on this computer. Um, 
but yeah, we just wanted to chime in and say we're also thinking that the week long model may work better um, since we're hoping to hopefully host a few burns. Um, hosting burns, like having a set week uh, would be a little bit easier for us than trying to coordinate a bunch of weekends. Um, so just like another, another thing to keep in mind, another perspective um, on why that model might be good. Uh, but obviously the weekend model does allow for a lot of flexibility for people who don't necessarily have a week that they can just take off of work or that their employer allows them to go to a trek. So definitely advantages to both, but we just wanted to add that perspective. Sam, thank you guys. Hey, Jared, I just wanted you to know that I'm in business too. So I turned my camera on. Um, so I think that, you know, there's no right answer to this question. And I think that with whatever we end up doing, we're going to end up excluding some people who can't commit to every weekend or who can't commit to a one or a two week thing. Um, so, but my, my experience with the Klamath tracks is that, and you know, the Klamath tracks is typically in the fall. And I think we've talked a little bit, you and I have talked a little bit about the issues with fall burning where, you know, oftentimes it's either too dry and then we get the rains and it's too wet. And so it's hard to, um, project the right time to burn on the calendar months in advance. Um, and so you end up, you know, committing to a time frame, and then if the conditions aren't right, you know, you can have issues. I think one way to alleviate that is with um, being flexible geographically. And so I think that one thing that really could inform this decision that we, um, that, you know, those of us on the call uh, don't have a lot of information about is where we have opportunities to burn. And I think that those conversations really have to happen together. Um, and I also know that this is a big region that we're talking about and that, um, you know, logistically travel time can really, um, eat into, you know, what we're trying to do on the ground. And, um, you know, there may be, um, you know, it may make sense to have the treks focused in a geographic area and then stick with that area. It, like, let's say we do a week and it's in one part of the central coast, and then we don't have the time to travel three hours to another area, um, but then, you know, we could have that hybrid model. I know that the Klamath treks um, this year where it went to seven, five day, you know, seven week long events um, with the weekends off and the weekends were covered by contract engines for things like patrol and mop up. Um, that worked really well because over that course of time, you know, they could move the base of operations. They could focus on areas that were in prescription with the weather and um, they could cancel a week if it was there was too much rain and people didn't have to make the the trip. So I, I would almost say that we have to one, like talk about, you know, what's available to burn and what, you know, when those things might be in. And then also just, I would say, let's consider being flexible in having maybe a hybrid model to start. I think that the reasons that people said a week is really nice are really valid like having that five day or longer period to build cohesion and build on experience and training um but then you could follow that up with with weekend events or midweek events or something like that where there's it transitions from a from a um you know a, a durate like an incident to an on-call over time and it would protract the overall time of the trex event and maybe we don't want to do that in our first go but it could potentially give us the best of both. So just some thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on, on that, Sam. I think those are all really good points. Um, the locations um, are diverse, which is why I didn't want to get too much into it, but it is a really important aspect of it. Um, um, and obviously they can get more diverse too, because we haven't even really tried to um, discuss, you know, say the potential of state parks being, I know we have state parks folks on the call, but, you know, would state parks want to be part of a burn um, as part of a trex, or would, you know, Pinnacles or Los Padres National Forest, um, those conversations haven't even happened yet. Um, but the, the Central Coast PBA does have burns in the works in all three counties. Um, so um, there is a lot of diversity of both habitat, whether it's a woodland understory, um, a grassland, a brushland, um, and, um, and everything in between. 
um, and then coastal versus, you know, far interior. I mean, San Benito County goes almost all the way to the Central Valley. So we have some pretty big um, differences in um, elevation and proximity to the ocean and such that I think um, plays to our benefit. Um, and then um, um, one thing um, I'll just personally say is um, the first treks that I ever went to um, had that cohesion because it was a, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a classic, whatever, two week type treks. And um, I think there's a lot of benefit to that. And I do understand that um, not everyone can do that, but not everyone can do the flexible model either, right? Where it's kind of like, hey, next week we have a good weather window, which is what the PBA already does for its burns. Um, um, and I definitely know there's people who, you know, if given enough lead time, they can take off, you know, a, a chunk of time from work to participate in something like this and plan around it, which I think is key as well. Um, but I also think, and Davey and I, we've had conversations about this where, um, you know, the participants of a Trex don't have to be the only person on a burn. Um, so that's just something for us to keep in mind. Really, the Trex is we're trying to create a vessel where we're trying to make sure those people who are a part of the Trex are getting to work on certain um, um, skill sets, right? Um, and so we're going to prioritize them for those skill sets and make sure those those opportunities. But as far as the actual burn goes, we can have other people participate. So you know, if we have say a rancher next door who wants to come burn, but he doesn't want to be a part of the treks on the ranch that he's right next door to, well, or, or she, um, then we can still allow them to do that. So um, we can, like Sam, you were saying, you know, we can have this kind of hybrid model um, as much as we want. Okay, I'll stop talking. Brian, you have your hand up. Uh, I think you all said actually everything I was thinking, so I don't need to say much more. Um, I just also want to point out that, um, and I think Sam had kind of said this, whatever way it happens, it's going to be awesome. And I think people need to, you know, it's not the, the way this one gets organized is not the final thing, right? There'll be maybe another checks down the road or another way of organizing to loop in some of those people who got left out with whatever way it gets organized. And I do think that seasonality and ge geography and kind of where burn units are might be one of the more important dictates because we don't want to spend a week driving to two different two or three different burn sites that are really far from each other um xyz right so um and obviously the fall is going to probably be serve a, a weekend model better and the spring might serve a, a week-long model better um and just just throwing it out there it's going to be awesome either way like people are really going to get pumped either way so um, so maybe this is a good transition to talk about seasonality and maybe some of the potential burn locations, um, since that's been coming up. Um, one thing I will throw out there, Phil Dye is not able to be on this call, but I did have a conversation with him. Um, we've contracted with him to do a lot of the burn bossing, um, for the PBA, uh, uh grant funded burns, which can be a part of, but don't have to be a part of the treks. And, um, it's much easier to book Phil for a known amount of time. Say, hey, Phil, we'd like to you know, hire you to be a burn boss for these two weeks or something like that for a week long period or something um, than it is to kind of try to get him on an on-call basis. Um, like this week, for instance, he's up in Humboldt burning and then he's gonna be burning at Sonoma um, on Thursday and you know he's kind of all over the place and so. Um, being able to book him is sometimes a nice aspect. And we're also in discussion with potentially other burn bosses um, just to have more flexibility too. Um, so on the seasonality question, um, um, fall obviously is a great uh, burn window. For instance, this past November, we had a, a great fall burn window um, where we had rain in October and then a drying trend um, in fall. Um, I think everyone's aware though that fall is probably one of our most very variable time periods um, as far as the weather goes. Um, winter can be a great burn window as we're seeing right this very moment. But again, it has those issues that uh, um, fall has um, and spring um, 
when we tend to talk about spring burns in this area, we're usually talking May. Um, sometimes it's a really dry spring, April, um, and then even into June. Um, and as Steve Davis was saying, um, those spring burns tend to be more of um, a woodland understory burn um, or a uh, grassland burns um, rather than like say brush burns because the brush tends to have too much moisture in it to, to burn. Um, so those are kind of the outlines of that. Um, I'm just curious people's thoughts and such on that. Um, if there's a particular interest in one seasonality or another. Um, also something we should keep in mind is um, um, seasonality of people camping because often on a trex, um, there's a lot of camping going on, um, a lot of living outdoors. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Any thoughts, questions? Oh, we have crickets. Um, so um, one thing I will say is that uh, the CCPBA um, has burns that we're working on that I would say um, would work in any of these uh, seasons. Um, one issue that has kind of been broached that's kind of an interesting one is, um, so spring we tend to, it's our most, um, predictable weather patterns. We tend to have, um, you know, the annual grasses are drying out by May. Um, we have higher fuel moistures than we do in the fall. So like our live fuel moistures um, for our trees and our brush, our um, humidities tend to be higher because of proximity to the ocean in the morning. And um, uh, temperature is obviously rising and winds rising in the afternoon. All those things are pretty predictable for us and a lack of rain tends to be fairly predictable for us in the spring, um, um, which can be nice to work with. So if we were to do a, say week long or two week long type flexible treks, spring would probably be an easier time period to do that. Um, and we do have burns that fit that, that time period, whether they're grassland or um, woodland understory burns. Um, but one issue that's come up with spring burns is um, it's uh, nesting season. So a lot of nesting birds are, you know, either in the grasslands nesting or they're in the woodlands nesting um, or brushlands nesting. Um, and um, Brian, I know you have experience with this with Audubon Canyon Ranch, as do I, which is trying to have ornithologists go through um, and look for rare ne nesting birds. Um, um, and to see if there's anything that, you know, we really don't want to disturb um, with fire. Um, it could actually be kind of an interesting part of all of this to add to the mix to bring in um, um, local bird organizations to help us with that and kind of talk about that and discuss the, the positives and the negatives and such. Um, so just kind of leave it there and see if there's, there's more thoughts on this. Hey, Jared. Yeah. Um, are there any seasonalities associated with cultural burning activities that we should uh, consider? You know, around preparing plants for use or things like that? It's a good question. I'm not the person to um, answer that, but there's definitely people on the call who, who might know that. Just want to mention one of the issues that we have with spring burning is, uh, first of all, bird nesting season. So uh, impacts to, to those species uh, and uh, sensitive species. Uh, so red -legged, that's red-legged frog season. So it's it just is a, a biological sign of annoyance. And uh, and then secondly, because the light fuel moistures are so high, we don't often get the same results from those burns as we do from fall burns. Good points. Jared? Yes, go ahead, Tom. I 
would like to say that in Big Sur, on our tribal lands, we we like to burn in January the grasses. We like to burn those periods of time. We get a grasslands and an understory. For us here on the coast, things can be different. In a typical a year like this, we just saw you know a major burn happen and have rapid burn from wind. You know, it's always hard to predict the wind in the winter time, but culturally we burnt, you know, under the oak trees for the acorn harvest, you know, the grasses and the underbrush so we before the acorn drops. But that's you know late September, early October, which is now you know high fire season for all of us in California. So we we would like our cultural burns we like to do during the winter. We typically get a dry period right after Christmas in January. We typically have basically a mini drought of two to three weeks, and we've seen that pattern ongoing. So, you know, as culturally possible, we would like to burn during those months, being in a very super high prone fire area, one of the hottest of the state in Big Sur. You know, I think that we would propose to do burns of those types during the winter time in between storms if we get a window, but it's hard to plan because as my grandfather always said, only fools and newcomers try to predict the weather, all else fail. We have to look to nature. We have to look to the cycles. But with climate change, everything's changed dramatically. You know, we just saw a 700 acre burn happen overnight basically with down sloping winds and you know, we have to, how do you plan around that? But again, just throwing in the cultural practice, that's when we do our burning and dry periods during the winter. So I just wanted to share that with the group. Thank you, Tom. Brian, you have your hand raised and Kate, I saw your video come on. Maybe you had thoughts too. Um, just a quick question. How, how, Jared, based on talking to folks down there, um, fire agencies and stuff, when we say spring burning, how late can we get that spring burning? I mean, I am always pushing for spring burning to actually mean early summer burning by some, you know, minds. And I'm just curious what you feel is politically possible down there. Um, my, my experience is I don't know because um, the PBA is so new to this area. Um, I don't think we've really been able to build up a body of work where we have either have or don't have the trust of fire agencies. Um, I think they're still trying to figure us out, um, which is reasonable. And um, the issue with, say, like June, as an example, or even July in this area is... Um, if we get a really dry spring, the way we say had last year, or maybe the way it's shaping up to be here right now, um, you know, it's like that, that early summer is just as, you know, um, um, of an issue as say August or, or September when it comes to wildfire. Um, um, so unknown, I guess is the answer. Yeah. Okay. I mean, cause it also seems to me if we're getting, if we're doing late, season spring burning, then that definitely from like a containment issue, wildfire, that gets my hackles up for anything that's going to hold heat, you know, um, it, you know, potentially into the wildfire season. So it's a consideration, right? <laughs> like I would burn grass in late spring. I would burn, oh, I might not burn a bunch of redwood or something, you know. Okay. Hey, Jared. Um, I know people um, burn shrubs for lots of different reasons. Um, and I was involved in a, a study looking at fire and mastication in shrubs in many different seasons. And um, that study showed that burning shrubs in the fall for chaparral um, oftentimes didn't have the best fuel hazard reduction in the long term. And also it homogenized the species to mostly just be chemise. So depending on the landowner objectives, burning um, the shrub, shrublands, especially chaparral in that winter time period may not achieve those goals. Although logistically it might be the only time period people can do anything. But I just wanted to, to, to bring that issue up in the sense of what, what goals people might have in terms of burning in shrublands and chaparral. Cool. 
Thanks. Tom, were you raising a hand? I didn't, I didn't see. No, okay. Um, so it seems like these are, these are really good questions that we have. Um, it doesn't seem like we have a, a clear answer, which um, isn't inherently the goal from this meeting. Um, um, it seems like this is something that's gonna take some time to, um, to tease out. Um, Steve, I see you have a hand raised. You wanna go for it? I'm just gonna say, uh, you know, it's gonna depend on your location. And, um, and then it's gonna depend on if it's private land or, or state or federal land, because there's more restrictions depending on the group. But I've burned in all these seasons and um, there's a real sweet spot in late spring and, and uh, where the grasslands will burn, but the brush won't because the brush is so greening up. And, um, and uh, my boss was a, what do you call one of the bird people and would go out on these burns with us and uh, was, was, was impressed with the results and, and the lack of impact on species. But it, again, it depends on your location. And I think every location is different. I think the big thing here is to plan a number of locations to get around all these, 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 these issues of uh, the species, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so um, again, I don't think we're gonna be able to answer this without a lot of the details to kind of go back to what Sam was saying without knowing exactly where burns are and such. So maybe one of the things we can try to do for a next meeting is create a map so that people have a visualization of um, you know, where the potential locations are. Um, it doesn't have to be exhaustive. Other ones can be added, obviously down the line. Um, but I think that'll help people visualize, um, you know, what, what the options are and such. Um, um, another question I think that we could jump into is um, kind of here in the last minutes is um, what some of the training is that might be of interest. Um, I was hearing, you know, the Carex prereqs rex um, be of an interest. Um, in other conversations I've heard chainsaw training be of particular interest. Um, um, Definitely, there's usually always interest in kind of the parts and pieces of burn planning. Um, what it, you know, um, what type of planning goes into burns. Um, I know there's a lot of interest out there in cultural burning. Um, and then, um, uh, what else was I writing down here? Oh, just the trying to have regular trainings too seems to be um, high on folks' list too. So if anyone has any, uh, thoughts on all of that. Um, Matthew, you have a hand raised. Yeah, sorry, I keep on jumping with questions. Um, so I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to speak to it this time or maybe through email or something, but um, do you have a sense or will you be able to create sort of a sense of what roles you might need for these, uh, for the large scale or small scale trexes so that we can, um, not only the roles, but also the time commitments. Um, so that uh, you can start identifying resources. So, you know, I'd like to know how I can help, but I don't know what role I might play or how much time is necessary and all that. Um, and maybe if you start accumulating, um, you know, people who are raising their hands, uh, you know who you can lean on or, or, uh, or you know who, who wants to learn more about those kinds of things. Just and Jared, in, in the past, we've done this kind of intro call and then a future call just focuses on the incident management team where you're kind of going through the org chart, explaining roles and responsibilities and time commitment, and that works really well. Thank you, Erin. That's awesome. I'm just trying to read some of the chat discussion here. Um, Sam here says, uh, maybe we could offer some Trek sponsored trainings leading up to the event especially something like chainsaw training, um, which can very much be a standalone thing. Great point. Yeah, um, yeah go for it. Uh, I would just add to, obviously this is live fire, but this uh, spot fire training, like we did this uh, last year in the grass is always super awesome for building team capacity. And then um, throughout there too, uh, pumps is always good. Just any, Just understanding how to work and run pumps and how water resources work so that People can jump on that if need be. Uh, 
Um, let's see, Connor, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in the suggestion or plug for as a training um, topic to, yeah, like grassland improvement, like habitat improvement. So um, burning to optimize native bunch grass habitat and annual grass and like uh, invasive annual grass and annual forb. Um, reduction things like that so i guess that would be like with a particular timing if it was like a spring um burn but that's 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 where my biases uh lie so that's it yeah i mean maybe we could even expand that comment to just be kind of fire ecology, fire restoration in general, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, prescribed fire being good for the land, as it's often said, but, you know, what are the specifics? What do we actually, you know, what's, what are the benefits and such? Good point. Um, so um, I'm just trying to look through the chat here. Um, Aaron, you um, offered a, um, a thought on the IMT, um, incident, incident management team here. I'm just going to read it. Um, for future discussion, as far as the IMT commitment goes, we found that time commitment for IMT ro roles range from about 20 hours to 100 hours leading up to the event, depending on the position. Some folks are liaisons and are just really listening in and planning on the planning calls and staying informed compared to someone operating as plan section chief, which is much more involved. Um, so um, obviously we haven't really gotten too much into the planning team and the roles. And I think that's gonna need a whole um, focused time period to do that we really don't have uh, time for, but um, maybe that's something we can um, make happen for the, the next meeting. So how about this? Um, let's maybe, unless folks have other um, comments on the discussion topics right now. And uh, Steve Davis, I, you've had your hand up, but I think it's maybe just been from your last comment or do you have something new to say? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we can transition in these last couple of minutes to uh, kind of the next steps. Um, and I think, one of the first questions I have concerning next steps is, um, um, is there anyone at this point, <laughs> maybe let me know in a uh, off channel um, if you wanna be, you know, if you're like, oh, I don't really have time for this or this isn't really my jam. Um, but otherwise we're just gonna keep assuming that um, you're interested in being involved in, to the extent that you can and we'll keep you, um, and, you know, keep you in the loop on communications and such. Um, one question I do have for say a next meeting is who should we try to focus on making sure that we have here besides the group that already is involved? Is there anyone hey. we're missing? So Jared, I was thinking about that. And recently just with the, the fire activity at the Santa Lucia preserve, we've been involving the resource management shop through Cal fire and they're, they're doing a lot of work in the area as far as burning um, treatments go to. So I think involving, some of those people talking to the battalion chief to see who he would want to assign to something like this, um, that they would be good people to have because they're, they're typically really into the GIS, the cooperative pre-plans of the whole Carmel Valley area and um, have a lot of experience and knowledge in the, the burning procedures that they have. Sounds good, thank you. Um, one I'll throw out there, which is just um, if we are to be trying to kind of um, not just be burning on private lands, um, having some kind of uh, federal partners like Los Padres or Pinnacles, I think would be smart. Jared, I don't know um, 
how easy your air quality management district is to work with or if you have multiple air quality management districts, but we try to include them at least at a high level. Our last one in Butte was fully integrated and wanted to be a FEMO, but some just want the high level to know what's going on. So they're more likely to grant permits during the TREX time window. Great, thank you. Yeah, our air quality, we're, we're kind of lucky down here in that um, um, A, all three counties fit within one air quality district. So that makes it a little bit easier. Um, the main individual that we work with, um, Chris Dominich, she has actually um, planned and run prescribed burns for um, Fort Ord, the base there. So she's actually um, um, kind of a, uh, an ace up our sleeves. It's really great. And then um, their process is free, <laughs> which is also amazing compared to other air, air districts. Um, so um, that's, a, that's a good point though, keeping them involved. So um, there, let's how see. about tribal lands? We got to make sure we have tribal lands on there to burn to, cultural burns on tribal lands. Yeah, where are you specifically thinking, Tom? And what, what tribe specifically are you? The Pomotsong and then the Aslan tribe have lands to burn. Yeah, we would definitely love to have um, Esalen tribal lands involved with the treks for sure. Um, the Amamutsu Land Trust definitely has um, representatives here um, on the call um, where they would want to be working, um, I think still, still has to be worked out some. Um, any other um, cooperators that we should be yeah, so I was also thinking, and I'm, I'm not sure if anyone is involved with the Monterey um, Fire Safe Council, and I know Jamie is, but there's a lot of activity in establishing firewise communities in the Carmel Valley area, even, you know, further south in Big Sur. And I think that that might be a good opportunity for them to sort of spread the word of what kind of activities are going on in this area. And you might find more people that are interested with with land in the Wui areas to burn. Okay, fire safe councils and fire wise. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> hey, Jared, I'm not sure if they, I think they should be at least involved, but uh, State Parks Monterey District, um, they're trying to think about fire, but they just haven't gotten there yet. So um, they would probably like to be involved. I don't, I don't know if they would have a burn on their lands, but they would like to get their folks trained, I'm sure. Also, I'd like to mention the Monterey Regional Park Management District, Paula Corona Regional Park, and Garland Park are developing a field management project program right now, applied for grants. So if somebody else would want to think about the local tracks area or PBA. Sounds good. Um, Davey? And then I'll just reiterate, you know, I think ranchers are important to at least kind of be in the loop on it. And so I can reach out to some ranchers um, through the Commons Association and, and other landowners through other venues as well. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think one thing that we could probably all use a tutorial on is the, the IMT um, kind of plant or roles um, that are on that team. Um, I know there were some slides that showed kind of the, um, some of the breakdowns and such. And so maybe for the next meeting, we can dive a little bit more into that um, with um, Aaron and Miller's help um, and kind of trying to tease out some of that. Um, I think also something we can work on, um, like I mentioned before, is a map of all the potential burn locations, at least the ones that we, we have lined up um, that could be a part of a TREX. Um, and we can try to, you know, um, demonstrate whether those are, you know, more of a, a woodland burn or a brushland burn or a grassland burn so that people can try to start kind of wrapping their minds around that. And we might even try to also put on that map um, kind of home base spots because that's always a big part of a TREX is, you know, 
where do you go back to at night? Where does dinner happen? You know, where is there the nighttime presentation? Um, um, things of that nature, or are people going home, which is another option too. Um, so that's something I think that Alex and I can work on as a map. Um, hey, Jared, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I have to jump on another call right now. So I'm going to leave, but I'm going to try to make you host or co-host and hopefully the recording will continue. So, okay. so I'm just going to jump good. off and make you host. I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you. And we're okay. going to wrap up here in a second. So um, I will um, probably try to do a poll. Well, I don't know if we'll do a poll. It's going to be so hard with such a big group. Um, I think we'll probably try to pick a time in early March when we can do another meeting. Um, um, and we will um, try to you know, get some of these other cooperators involved. We will um, work with Aaron and Miller on the IMT stuff. Um, and we'll work on having a map that demonstrates kind of where we can potentially burn as part of a Trex and um, try to maybe jump into the subject of seasonality and, and such. So um, I think that's about it. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's just afternoon. It's been a long meeting. Thanks for hanging in there, everyone. Really appreciate it. A special thanks to uh, Aaron and Hannah for joining us. Um, and uh, getting this ball rolling for us. And um, so thank you all and uh, we'll be in touch.